Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining this uh, session. Um, so before we start the session itself, maybe some uh, word about housekeeping. Um, so you know that you can ask questions through the Q&A menu, which can be found at the bottom of the Zoom window. Uh, you can also uh, use this option to upvote questions from uh, others. And uh, when you submit a question, please mention the name of the speaker to whom the question is addressed, which will be very helpful for us. Uh, so you will see that we have the chance to have six speakers, which means that we have little time between the talks. Uh, but we will try our best to be on time, and uh, maybe we are going to limit the question to the speaker to one uh, during this talk session, and uh, we will move the other questions to uh, the mid-speaking session. Um, so before uh, we start the, the talk, I would like to present myself. So I'm Vincent Zouet. I am um, one of the two group leaders of the Molecular Modeling Group of the Swiss Institute of Bioinformatics, and I am also a an assistant professor at the University of uh, Lausanne. I don't know, if, uh, Chan, if you would like to, to present yourself. Yeah, just a, a brief um, uh, introduce of myself. I'm Chan Cao, a postdoc researcher from EPFL Mandel Dopreras uh, Group, Laboratory for molecule, Biomolecular Modeling. I'm working on biological nanopore for molecular sensing, and I'm so delighted today to be co-chair and host this section with uh, Wayson together, and looking forward for your talks. Thank you. So let's start with the first talk. Uh, so we have the pleasure to start with François Bonardel from the group of Frédéric Lissacek of uh, Geneva, who is going to talk about prediction of carbohydrate binding proteins in microbial proteasomes and uh, about uh, uni, um, uh, sorry, the database attached to this, uh, to this topic. Thank you, uh, Francois, the floor is yours. Okay, so I will start with sharing the presentation and then we move on to the presentation. Okay, so does everyone have the presentation? Yes. Looks good. So, hello everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, for a presentation for the SIP days. Uh, so, I'm a PhD student uh, working with both the team of Frédéric Lizasek in uh, Geneva, which is the peak team, and uh, also with Annie Berti team in Grenoble at the CERMAD. And so my work focused mainly uh, in uh, developing unilectin.eu uh, web portal, which is dedicated to the classification of the lectin and the prediction of uh, these lectins in all available uh, genomes. And for uh, the following talk, I will focus mainly on uh, my results of prediction uh, in the microbial uh, proteomes uh, in bacteria. And uh, I would like to highlight also that it's uh, financed uh, by the University of Geneva and Glico Alps in Grenoble. Okay. So, first, I will redefine what are lectins because they are only one part of uh, carbohydrate binding protein. So the distinction is that lectins have at least one non-catalytic domain that binds uh, to uh, a glycan or uh, different types of uh, monoan oligosaccharides. It is not an antibody and it does not have an enzymatic function. There is a, a distinction between the lectins and the CBM so the lectins will be alone on a protein or uh, separated of other domains uh, compared to the CBM, which will be always next to an enzymatic domain or sometimes even uh, superposed with it. The lectins can be found in the extracellular matrix, in the vacuole and on the cell surface and is very important for the interaction uh, between host and pathogens. If we look at the uh, Unilectin web portal, which I uh, developed uh, during the last two years, um, 
I have uh, the already uh, presented Uniectin 3D module, which contain the curated uh, structure of the lectin and provides uh, different types of information. It has been published in NAR. There is also the Proplex do domain, uh, Proplex module of the website, which focus on the propeller lectins, which is a, a type of fold. And uh, so I have been predicted all this type of uh, propeller lectin, and we have uh, had very good luck with the prediction, and we were able to publish it in structure with the identification of a new types of propeller in nature. And finally, the part I will focus on is the prediction of all the lectins. So if we take a step back at the classification of the lectins in Unilectin 3D, there is a lot of uh, types of folds. Uh, for example, beta barrel, or you can have some beta prism and some alpha beta barrel. There is all types of folds that can be used to recognize the glycans. And uh, the folds are now in uh, the new classification that we provide on Unilectin 3D. It is now the first level for the classification. As the fold uh, for the proteins is uh, more conserved compared to the sequence. So the classification of the lectins works uh, in four levels with the fold, followed by uh, the class, which uh, distinct, so lectin of a same fold sharing at least 20% of sequence similarity. This criteria is based on uh, the one used by CATHDB. So they, uh, they uh, advise to use 20% of sequence similarity at least for a same fold. And then we have the family level at 70% of similarity. And finally, the PDB structure in each uh, family. For the prediction of the lectins, I use my class that share at least 20% of second similarity to define proper lectin domains. So in total, I have uh, now, for now, 108 distinct lectin classes based only on the 3D structure on lectins. I will explain how I uh, generate my conserved motif of lectin using the proplex uh, part. So if we take a look at the propeller, it can have from five to seven repeated domain. And each repeat is a lectin domain able to bind to a glycan. So by using the repeats, by cutting every lectin domain and aligning them together, and also, I use all the available structure for sharing 20% of similarity for the same fold. And I align them together and I am able to get a proper conserved motif, which is used after this for the lectin de novo prediction. And the problem is, uh, in if I focus on all the prediction, I have too much prediction. I have more than 500,000 prediction of lectins. It's very too much. And if I select only the prediction in the bacterial genomes, after filtering based on the uh, similarity score, I have uh, 42,000 uh, predicted lectins. So it's quite a lot. And uh, so, Inside of all this lectin, what is interesting to do is to compare the fold distribution of the 3D structure we know with the fold distribution of all the predicted bacterial lectins. And as we can uh, see, uh, for the 3D structure, we have mostly uh, information for the beta sandwich piliadesine fold, the OB fold the beta fold and the beta, beta sandwich to calcium lectin. And so this distribution is completely uh, mixed uh, in, uh, after the prediction, uh, where I have most of my prediction for the lysem domain and for the trefoil, beta barrel, and beta helix domain. 
So what does it mean? It means that we have quite a lot of predicted lectin in the bacterial kingdom that uh, might be interesting to crystallize to have their free structure and to have more information uh, inside how lectin works and how they interact with glycans. So uh, the problem with the bacterial uh, is that we have too much prediction, so uh, we didn't know uh, on which uh, food start uh, in all, the, all of these. And uh, thanks to a contact uh, and a collaboration with the Imperial College uh, in London, we were able to focus on the vaginal microbiome uh, and to check uh, the interesting parts uh, for the health and disease. So what they have at the Imperial College in London is information for the vaginal microbial dysbiosis and inflammation. And they know which uh, species and strains will help uh, to have better pregnancy outcomes compared to other uh, species and strains that will uh, be linked with uh, uh, issues and disease with inflammation and dysbiosis. And thanks to this, we have a list of lactobacillus uh, bacteria, which are really interesting as they are able to protect during the pregnancy compared to Garnerella, Prevotella, Streptomyces, Streptococcus, and in particular Lactobacillus inners which uh, will be linked with uh, problems. And so the question we asked ourselves was, is there a link between these species that might uh, have differences and the lectum? Because uh, as the lectins has important between host and pat pathogen, it might be very interesting to see uh, if uh, there is a correlation between the two of them. So, by uh, using the lectin class defined previously and the concert motif, I uh, predicted the lectins in these species in as many strains as possible uh, by only selecting the strains known in the vaginal microbiome. And thanks to this, we were able to have uh, a type of barcode of lectins for each of uh, these species. And uh, so here, the, the identification of lectin is restricted to the list of uh, species I just told, uh, told about, but we also try to enlarge a little bit to other species to see if uh, it has the same kind of repartition. So what is very interesting to see is that uh, for the probiotic uh, lactobacillus in green, we can see that uh, they have a very low number of lectin class that are present. And in fact, there is only the lysem lectin, which is uh, present in most of them and is in fact a, a household uh, lectin, which is not uh, the most important for host pathogen interaction. And if we take a look in orange and red to the more pathobiont and pathogen uh, species, we can see that there are much more lectin types uh, of these multiple classes. And for example, if we take a look at the serine rich repeat lectin class, uh, it is present in uh, many bacterial uh, pathogens and also in lactobacillus inners. It's really nice to see the difference between the lactobacillus in general and the lactobacillus inners which has uh, different types of uh, lectin classes. So for now, it's only at the correlation level uh, to have the proof that lectins uh, have an effect on the pathogenic uh, level of this species. The, the, the next step would be to have a binding array and to see if lectins have a role in the pathogenicity of uh, these other species, but uh, it's really interesting uh, as a first step for the prediction of lectins. Okay, so uh, to conclude and 
for the prospect, I have my Unilect in portal with Unilect in 3D part uh, that provides now curated information for more than 2,000 structures of lectins with 108 lectin class. So for now, the classification is not yet published, but it will be uh, when uh, we have the complete uh, paper for the microbial prediction part. Um, this classification uh, allowed us to first predict for beta propeller lectins and have uh, obtained a nice uh, new propeller structure. And then the prediction of all lectins, with, which opened the doors to the exploration of lectins in fungal, bacteria, and viruses, uh, and many, many more others possibilities of, uh, of exploration. So in fact, we are uh, always open for collaboration with uh, other teams that might be interested uh, in the lectin profile of their specific organism. I would like to thank everyone and to highlight that uh, after my PhD, a new position will be available uh, between Geneva and Grenoble for the further continuation of this project. And you can check unilectin.eu website to access this offer. Okay, we will now take a look at the question. Conversation. I, uh, sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. So I have a, a question. Do Do you have any plan already to uh, share the data that you are collecting or predicting to more integrated databases like Uniprot or PDBKD? So for now, in Uniprot, we have already uh, put all. Uh, the 3D structure of lectins that are classified. Um, but uh, as a next step, it will be to put all the information of the predicted lectins in Uniprot as uh, curated annotation. Mm -hmm. But uh, we still have the uses of, uh, of defining a proper score threshold to say, okay, this one is a lectin, but this other one might be a lectin, but we are not sure about it but it will be uh, normally uh, the next step after the end of my PhD to have all this information available in Uniprot. Okay, thank you very much. So before we go for the next talk, I would like to remind all the attendees that uh, you can ask questions through the Q&A box that you will find at the bottom of the Zoom uh, uh, window. So thank you very much, Francois. Uh, so the next question will be taken during the, the mid uh, the speaker session. So now uh, we will leave the floor to Luciano Abriata from Matteo Dal Peravo Group at the PFL uh, in Lausanne. Uh, so Luciano is going to talk about the state of the art web services for modeling the structures of proteins that lack clear templates in the PDB. So uh, thank you, Luciano, for, for starting. Welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Okay, I'm uh, sharing. Should be sharing now. Yes, I have another computer to see everything is coming. It's coming good. So thank you. I will try to be uh, brief and go to the, the things that should be of most interest to you. I hope you will find it interesting and useful. I summarize here my title. What I'm going to talk about is modeling the structures of proteins that have no clear templates in the PDB. Okay. So uh, let me activate the laser because I use it a lot and, and you will not see it. Uh, laser pointer. Okay, yes, here. So uh, this presentation is in the in my website. If you want to go and follow there, you can you can see everything I will be saying. You will have all the links. So for sure, you already know that if you have a new sequence whose structure you want to know, you go to the PDB. Maybe you are lucky you find the structure. If not, um, if not, then you know you can do homology modeling. If you fla if you find the protein of similar sequence. Uh, then you can do threading and alignment and threading, all that you know already. Now, the problem comes when you want to do a initial prediction. Then you have to use some kind of some different method, um, which in principle are work much uh, worse than uh, homology uh, based modeling. But as I will show you here, 
in recent years, there have been very uh, impressive advancements in our capacity to do ab initio predictions, so without templates. This is coming from our experience, Matteo Dalperaro, my PI, and me, in, uh, in the CASP. So for those of you that who don't know what CASP is, this is a kind of contest on uh, structure prediction. So which essentially what CASP does, uh, so it has been going around for more than a quarter of, of a century already. And uh, there's a group of organizers who secure new structures that haven't been released by the PDB. Then they take the sequences of these new structures, they send the sequences to the predictors, predictors build models, then they send the models back to the CASP organizers and the CASP organizers contact independent assessors who compare the models to the targets, trying to, to come up with an evaluation, who is doing best, uh, what parts of the protein can be correctly modeled, what parts are still very challenging and all this kind of assessment. So now, right now CASP 14 started, is taking place every two years. In CASP 12 and 13, Matteo and me, we were uh, assessors in this track of CASP that has to do with modeling tertiary structures of proteins uh, when they are very difficult to, mo to, to model by uh, through homology. So you can go and read in detail these papers in, in proteins. So this uh, journal has a specific issue dedicated to CASP. If you go here, you will find all the details about evaluations and progress and rankings in CASP 12 and 13. Very briefly, what we introduced in CASP 12 is this kind of web app that I can show you running live. So it's a kind, it's a, a web app implemented in a web server that takes for a given target whose structure predictors model, it implements lots of uh, scoring metrics that help us navigate through the models. And then all everything that you see here is a model. And then we can compare the target structure, which we know because we are participating as assessors. And we can compare each structure with each model that was submitted. And then this is coupling in 3D. So we can do all kinds of uh, evaluations on the different models and then come up with our conclusions. So going back to the, to the presentation, of course, one very important thing in CASP, especially in this track about very hard modeling, very hard targets. One very important thing is try to, to, to track if there is uh, any improvement over time. So as I told you, CASP started like 1994 with CASP 1. What you see in this plot is each CASP edition very annually. And then the Y axis is a kind of uh, score that measures the quality of the best models that we had for all the targets in each CASP. So this score is such that if you are above 70, 80, then essentially your model is perfect. At, it's within one angstrom of backbone RMSE. Now, if you are under 25, 30, then the model is not better than any random spaghetti model that you could that you could build. Now, starting at 30, you kind of define the overall shape of the of the of the protein quite well. You capture it. As you see, this is a median plus minus standard a deviation of the mean. So there are some points somewhere here and here. But overall, what you see is that in the first cusps, until like cusp 11, 12, then models were barely capturing the, the overall topology. Now in CASP 12, when we started uh, being evaluators, we were lucky to see that people were starting to model proteins much better. And then actually in CASP 13, the jump was even stronger. This, of course, suffice to say that uh, target difficulty was more or less similar in the last three CASPs. And, uh, and that the assessment is always based on the same metric. So it's not a matter of the assessment changing. This is reflecting that actually methods for predicting structures without templates are working better. And why are they working better? Well, already by the time of CASP 10 or 11, people started to solve this problem that was around for some time uh, that allows them to predict contacts in a sequence. So how does this work? Very briefly, because very likely you are already familiar with this. So suppose this is a sequence of the protein that you want to model, then what you do is you build an alignment and then you look for pairs of amino acids that co-evolve. So here you see these arginines of positive amino acid here that co-evolves with this negative amino acid here. That's because they, it's forming an important contact. Maybe they will mutate, but when one mutates, the other one has to mutate as well. For example, here you, in this in these proteins, you have two hydrophobic residues that will still pack and make a contact. So the problem that got solved are by the time of CASP 10, 11, was to try to infer these contacts based on these correlations that you have in alignments. And by uh, getting these contacts, then people could fold 
proteins really by trying to satisfy the predicted contacts and that's how we got this increase in uh, model quality by CASP12. Then there was a further increase that we saw in CASP13 uh, which came about by the introduction of machine learning methods for molecular modeling. Going very quickly there because it's a lot of bibliography probably I missed some important paper here uh, but uh, how does this work? Well these machine learning methods what they do is essentially they take a sequence then from the sequence you they build an alignment from the alignment you can compute residue coevolution just like i showed you before but you also get these kind of features which are linear features or also from alignments which measure say a probability to be a solvent exposed or or buried a secondary structure propensity different kind of things but then the the, the key thing that came up in casp 13 is that the, the best predictors what they were doing was to actually learn contacts, distances, and even orientations between different residues from PDB structures. So the, the, the best predictors in CASP13, they were integrating all this information to predict contacts, distances, and orientations that they could then use for folding, okay? Directly for folding, or you can also use the patterns of contacts to go and search the PDB, but not at the sequence level, which maybe will not give you anything because that's why, by definition, these are very hard targets. But maybe you will find a pattern of contacts that is already there. Okay, and then you can select that. You do an alignment based on the patterns that you that you found, and then you can do some kind of threading. Actually, most of the most successful uh, servers and, and, and human predictors in CASP13 they were using a combination of folding and threading, mostly folding, using the predictions. So this looks very nice here. I'm showing you very quickly just some. A couple of examples. If you go to our CASP assessment paper in CASP 13, uh, got published last year, you can see all this in detail and then the supporting information is full of explanations. You can see here, for example, here you have one target, say this one, 140 amino acids, got modeled super very well over the full sequence over 2.3 angstrom. So the, the, the prediction quality that, that you can achieve is really remarkable. Of course, all the assessment that we are doing here is at the backbone level. Side chains, typically were not evaluated in this track of CASP because as you saw before, the models tended to be not so good. But I think in the future, CASP will move into look at the, looking at the side chains as well. So how can you benefit from all this, which is what I promised you from the first slide. I will go again very quickly because there's not much time, but if you want details, see these two papers, especially the second one that got accept, accepted now on Friday. And it's a kind of review, but also doing analysis where we describe what we think are the best servers and, and some data sets, as I will show you briefly now. So if you go to that paper that I think will, will be out in a couple of weeks, you can go to table one and you will see our assessment combined with the CASP assessments of what we think are the best servers that today implement all these technologies. We discuss lost of several aspects about them. But then another thing I wanted to show you is these four data sets, these are in table two of our article, which uh, these are, this is a very interesting thing. So what the people from the, these other servers here, what they did was they realized, okay, if these models, if, if these uh, methods are working so well, we could go to PFAM, we take all the PFAM families for which there's no structure in the PDB and we try to model them. Okay, so they did that and based on quality estimations, they could provide together these four, four data sets at least one model for over 2,000 structurally uncharacterized PFAM families. And in principle, they are quite confident according to their uh, evaluation. And that's not little, this is like 12% of PFAM. If you check the PDB, you can already today just go find structures for 55 of PFAM. So these models give you a further 12%. That means for roughly two thirds of PFAM, you have some, some structural uh, insights. Now, what happening? Okay, so one thing that we looked at in the paper is that since publication of these data sets, for example, one that I showed you there from the from the David Baker group was from 2017. So since publication, there was a, there were a couple of structures that came out, and having these structures allowed us to do a, an, an evaluation independent of the CASP evaluation. So we did that. I'm showing you here a few examples, and in the paper there will be more. And you can see, for example, just to show you one here, this is a protein 257 residues, and this model is getting like 90% of the residues within 2.7 angstrom um, uh, accuracy at the backbone level. So I think that's also remarkable. And where we could, could compare these data sets, we found that roughly when the models cover more of the domain, they tend to be better, okay? This is the, our 
assessment based on the structures that came out later. <clears throat> there are more details also in the paper. Uh, but I wanted to show you one last tool. So this is what we call model search. Imagine that you have a new, a new sequence that you want to model. You know that it's not there in the PDB, but you, you wonder maybe it's in one of these data sets or somewhere else that somebody already took time to model and maybe we can use this. So what you can do is you go to our, our model search link, which is described in this paper here. You take a sequence and this will kind of do a kind of blast on all these data sets. It will also blast in the PDB dev for integrated models in the database of SACS based models in all the CASP models. Some CASP targets were modeled, but then they were never released, maybe a 1%. Uh, so it may be interesting to find what people modeled uh, and in some other resources. And then this will give you back models that maybe you can use now for homology modeling based not on an experimental structure, but on, a, on, a, on one of these models that you find in the database. So uh, I went very quick because I wanted to show you many things, details we can talk later and also in the, in the paper, that, especially the paper that will come out soon. So I wanted to, to, to thank here Matteo De Perón, my PI, who, with whom uh, we did all these evaluations and all these studies. Also Giorgio, who was very important in the CASP for CASP 12 to help implement lots of, of analysis and he was also doing evaluations himself. Then CASP, being an assessor in CASP was a wonderful experience. I got to know lots of people, I learned a lot about structural bioinformatics and also experimental structural biology. Uh, it's very important to acknowledge the structural contributors because without them, there, there would be no CASP. Uh, the predictors and the previous assessors, as I show you in that very quickly in that slide in the website, there are many metrics that we use that they developed and then we implemented them in the website. Then I also like to, to help uh, the SIB, especially Francisca Solange uh, and Rob and Chan and Vincent, Vincent, who put this up. I think so far it's going very, very good. So I'm happy to, to be presenting here. And as a last thing, if you are involved in some collaboration with experimentalists or you run an experimental lab yourselves, uh, consider donating your structures to CASP. They will remain confidential. They are not released, only them and the, the assessors see them. And you will help everybody. One thing I didn't say here, is that there are increasingly more cases where these models are getting so good that you can use them for molecular replacement and then to face data that you couldn't face in, in any other way unless you collected some uh, anomalous dispersion or some, something like that. Then these models are also using, being used a lot to be put into mid-resolution cryo-EM maps, which still dominate um, the, the cryo-EM database. And, and of course, there are lots of reports. We summarize some of them in, the, in our paper uh, about practical use that these models have in driving forward biology, maybe at the low resolution, but enough to, to, to move the, the science forward. That's it. Thank you. And I will take questions if we have time. Yep. Thank you very much, Luciano. So indeed, we have a couple of questions. So I will just pick the first one from Anna Claudia Sima. So what role did domain expertise play in designing the system that won CAP 13 from DeepMind? What are the implications for future editions and participants of the challenge? Uh, can, can, can you, sorry, repeat the first part of the question? The, uh, that... So what role did domain expertise play in designing the system that won CAP 13 from DeepMind? And what are the implications for future editions and participants of the challenge? Okay, I'm not sure I understand the, the, the question. Maybe we, we can talk more later. But uh, yeah, the winner was the, the winner, let's say. In CASP, they don't like to say winner. <laughs> but the, the, the group that performed best was AlphaFold from Google DeepMind. Uh, they were using this technology I showed you before. They didn't invent it, but they pushed it to the, to, to the, to the limit, I'd say. And they do some very, very important uh, improvements and extensions. Um, the, the problem with them is that what they provide is not a server. So there was a lot of, in principle, you could guess there was a lot of human intervention or something like that. Maybe in selecting the best models, these kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, probably one should read in detail their papers to be sure about that. But what's sure is it's not a server that you can use. That's why it didn't appear in the tables. The technology they use is the same I show you. And for the future, what's missing? Well, most of these very nice models I show you uh, apply, uh, they are very nice, very good at the, at the domain level. But then when you start having different domains that come together, and this, until CASP 12, I would say there was very little chance to get something good. In CASP 13, some groups, including them, 
uh, they started to put together the domains in, into something that kind of makes sense, but there's still a lot of progress needed there. Then the other thing that needs uh, to be uh, improved is, well, the side chains, actually they are so far not even evaluated. So, but I think they will be evaluated in the future given that the models are getting so good. And the other very important thing is developing on quality estimates. So you want to know as a user, you get a model, you want to have a number that tells you how likely it is that it is good globally and also at the residue level. And some of the groups are starting to work on that. Okay. Uh, we have some examples in our CASP uh, 13 paper. Okay. Thank you, Luciano. Um, Welcome, thank you. So we are going to move to our next speaker, uh, Olivier Binucolo from the group of Stéphane Kellenberger at the University of Lausanne. Uh, so Olivier is going to talk about responses of ion channels to pH fluctuations investigated through uh, molecular dynamic simulations. So Olivier, if you'd like to start. Thank you, Hassan, for the nice introduction. I start sharing my screen. Um, so in this uh, presentation, um, the, the purpose is to uh, show you some uh, illustration of how the use of uh, um, of uh, advanced or, or classical molecular dynamic uh, simulations can help us get in a better understanding of the relationships between the structure and the function of proteins. Example will be taken from a family of channels that I will uh, just introduce uh, afterwards, but the strategies uh, or the, the tools that will be shown, uh, they can be applicable to any protein that you might be interested in. So in the group where I am working, we are interested in ASICs. These are the acid sensing ion channels. You see on the left, uh, trace, also if you perform a voltage clamp uh, experiment, you will have some current because these are neuronal uh, proton activated sodium channels. Uh, they are activated by a drop of the pH, as you can see on the pH uh, shown above. And uh, after having opened, they, they, will, they will just spontaneously close again in a so-called desensitized state in which they are unable to open again. Now, there will be the only experimental uh, figure that we have to understand, to understand the, the, the following. So if we draw the, the current uh, normalized to the maximal current as a function of the pH, as you see here with this, uh, in this order, we can see that with, uh, at a given pH, we have 50% of the current. That is what they, we call the pH 50 of activation. So in terms of structure, we do have uh, structures of all the states. So here, the open and the closed state are shown. If we now would uh, perform a superposition of them, we see some um, conformational changes, uh, some uh, helix orientation, some uh, things are moving uh, um, from one side to the next. But these structures, they do not give us any information about the two questions that I will present now. So who are the, or where are the pH sensors, these uh, residues, that might take a proton during the acidification. And because of this uh, change of their protonation state will affect their surrounding that will ultimately lead to the opening of the channel. And in addition, these uh, structures, they do not inform us at all about the transition or the different pathways that are possible between the closed and the open state. And now we'll show two uh, methods that can be used to investigate these things. So if you have any proteins that you are interested in and this protein might be sensitive to pH, uh, these are some tools that you could use. The first one is a very old one, a classical one, but still very useful. This is uh, pK calculations based on the structure. Uh, the only thing that we have to know is that the pKa that you learn in the textbook uh, for a uh, um, amino acid can be very strongly shifted if this residue is sitting within a protein. So we are using tools, some equations that we solve. And uh, in this case, I have uh, investigated the pKa of all the residue in the residues in the channel in the closed and the open structures. And now you need some criteria to identify a pH sensor. These are at least two. The pKa in the first state, so the closed state, must be more or less close to the pH 50 of activation. And the second criteria 
you should observe a strong shift between the two states. So the PKA of this residue should change. Then you can have uh, the idea that you have identified a pH sensor. So I, uh, I did that for the structure. Here I show only a stretch of it. And if we look carefully, we see this lysine 211, who has a PKA close to eight, in the closed state and just above uh, six in the open state. And the gray zone represents more or less the pH 50 of activation. So it's a good candidate. Do we have experimental support? Of course, yes, we have. A uh, group performed uh, recently a deletion of this uh, residue. And what we could see is uh, we remember the pH 50 of activation. Here we will have the, the white type. And upon deletion of this residue, the pH 50 of activation was, the, the activation curve was right shifted, which means because this residue is lacking, this uh, channel requires more than 100 times more protons to open. So this confirms that this uh, residue is a pH sensor. A second technique that we can use, which, is, uh, which has been developed recently, is the so-called constant pH molecular dynamic simulation. You might all remember that molecular dynamics deal with classical physics, so you will never build or um, uh, build a um, covalent bond. Yes, some tools have been uh, developed, and I am using some of them to run molecular dynamic simulation at constant pH. This means you constantly uh, assess the protonation state of all the residue in your uh, channel. Here I have uh, done some uh, replication at low pH to mimic the acidification, at high pH like physiological to mimic the uh, physiological pH. And in this uh, case, I will just show an example of building or breakage of salt bridge because it's just the easiest to show. Uh, the ASIC channel that I am studying forms trimers, and here we have two residues that are uh, building some a salt bridge between two subunits, so glutamate and, and arginine. You just easily count the number of occurrence in which you have this glutamate protonated. And as expected, at the acidic pH, you have a lot of occurrence uh, in which this glutamate has been protonated, and almost never at the uh, uh, high pH. If you look at the time series of the distance between the side chain of the acidic and the alkaline uh, residue, you see that at, phys at physiological pH, these two residue might uh, remain at a given short distance to each other, and at pH 5, they seem to move away, which is yeah, logic if one is protonated. But do we have experimental support that the molecular dynamic simulation has indeed reproduced something that we can uh, uh, be confident in. Yes, if we compare with the crystal structure, we see that at pH uh, 7.4, so the physiological one, we have exactly the same distance as the one measured in the simulations. At the acidic pH or in the open structure, it's 11 while we find 9.5. This means the simulation was on the way to more or less reproduce the uh, X-ray structures. We have additional uh, experimental support. So a uh, given group has mutated these two residues into cysteines and investigated uh, using oxidative or reductive condi conditions how this might affect the channel. We see that upon uh, oxidation, so when the two residues are close or maintained together, they cannot move uh, apart and the channel again has problems to open. So this shows us that also these techniques is now mature to reproduce experimental settings, experimental observation. But of course, in addition, you will have all the intermediate steps. You can study how the channel changes conformation, and then you can really understand how this protein functions with this. I'd just like to thank all of you for your attention. and. Uh, Benoit Roux from Chicago for support in the constant pH molecular dynamic simulation, uh, the group where I am working with Stéphane Kellenberger, and the group of uh, Vincent Zouet, uh, which hosts me as a bioinformatician. And now I am ready for your questions. 
So thank you very much, Olivier. So indeed, we have questions, but uh, unfortunately, we are running late in the meeting. Uh, so we will keep the questions for the Meet the Speakers session a bit later. And uh, uh, so thank you again, Olivier. And right now, I'm going to, to leave the Zoom uh, to uh, channel. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's welcome our next speaker, Professor Andrew Cavalli. He received his PhD in pharmaceutical science from the University of Bologna and did postdoc and uh, SISSA <laughs> and ETH. Now he's a professor in uh, medicinal chemistry at the University of the Bologna and the research director at the in Italian Institute of Technology, where he's also deputy director for the research domain computation and data science. So today he's going to share with us about his work about, uh, of uh, machine learning for predicting toxicity of immunoglobulin light chains. So please. Okay, let me start by sharing my my screen and and maybe just a short note, the, the, the Andrea Cavalli you presented is an anonymous, it's not me. So I'm not working in Bologna, but I'm working at the IRB in Bellinzona, which is an institute in the southern part of Switzerland. So today I will speak about light chains and uh, so light chain amyloidosis. Essentially light chain amyloidosis is a disease related with the misfolding of light chains, of immunoglobulin light chain, which detaches from, from the heavy chain and form toxic aggregates or amyloid fibrils that accumulate in heart and kidney mostly, causing fatal organ dysfunction and eventually death. Now, each patient carries a unique sequence, which raises the question, which are the molecular determinants of light chain toxicity? Now, the light chain, the sequence of a light chain is a result of the, the, the maturation of, of B cells, which starts in the bone marrow with a hemopoietic stem cell and terminates either with a, an antibody secreting plasma cells or with a memory B cell. During this maturation, light chains go through essentially two differentiation states. The first one is the VDJ recombination, which generates a, native, a naive B cell by recombining V, D, v and J genes. A second phase comes then in which somatic hypermutations are added to the sequence to increase the affinity of the, of the antibody towards the antigen. Now, from the structural point of view, light chain homodimers are similar to antibody fabs. However, light chain homodimers do not have any biological function. On the contrary, fabs are responsible for binding the antigen. So our hypothesis is that because this lack of structural and biological uh, checkpoint, mutations which are added to FABs to increase the affinity of the antibody might be in some cases detrimental for the stability of light chain homodimer, leading to the generation of toxic species. Now, to further investigate the role of somatic mutation of determinant of light chain toxicity, we collected a large database of sequences comprising 600, roughly 600 non-toxic sequences and 400 toxic ones. Then all sequences were aligned to the reconstructed germline sequence in order to identify somatic mutation, which were then used to train a mach machine learning machine learning based classifiers. Now this slide shows the result of our best predictor which we call LICTOR which means light chain toxicity predictor. As you can see our it's based on a random forest algorithm and as you can see the AUROC of the predictor is roughly 0.9 and the sensitivity and the specificity of the predictor is around 0.8, which means that Lictor is able to correctly classify toxic and non-toxic sequences in 80% of the cases. 
Now, to validate our approach, we obtained six sequences not present in our training database, three of which were toxic and three of which were from patients with multiple myeloma, which is another plasma disease, but does not generate toxic light chain. And in all six cases, the prediction, the Lictor was able to predict the right phenotype, assessing the, the, the cardiotoxic as toxic and the multiple myeloma as non-toxic. Next, we wanted to see if our approach could also identify which mutation exactly is responsible for the for the toxicity among the, the five, six, seven that typically are present on a light chain. So what we did was to revert one after the other, all mutation to their germline value and see which, one, which were, in which cases we could change the phenotype of the light chain. So by starting from a toxic one, we change, a, we introduce a first, we revert the first mutation and had a non-toxic uh, light chain, and then we added a second Y in one to even to decrease the, the toxicity even further. So we had three sequences, the wild type and Q2 mutants, which were predicted one toxic and two non-toxic. Now we wanted to assess if this correlates with, 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 with a phenotype that could be assessed. And for this, we, we assessed, we expressed the, this light chain recombinantly and tested them on two validated uh, models. One is an in vivo model based on C elegance and the other one is a test with the vi viability of human cardiac fibroblast. As you can see from this image, the red one is the wild type, is the only light chain that has a toxic phenotype. The single mutant and even more the, the double mutant does not have any an effect which is uh, statistically different from a vehicle. In the same way there is we have a, 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 a concentration dependent uh, toxicity so decrease of viability uh, in cell if we add toxic light chain to cardio fibroblast. It should be noted that the concentration the highest concentration here 800 nanomolar is roughly half of the concentration that patients have in their blood. So concluding, somatic hypermutation are key determinants of light chain toxicity in light chain amyloidosis. And Lictor can exploit this somatic mutation to classify light chain as toxic or non-toxic with an accuracy of roughly 80% percent, making it a, a very valuable tool for early IL diagnosis in patients. Lictor is available as a web server at the IRB. And as last, I would like to acknowledge some person that helped me in this project and SNF for funding and you for your attention. Thank you a lot, Andrew. I'm really sorry for my wrong information about you. And since we are a little bit run out of time, so I think we can leave the question for the next section. And uh, we will welcome our next speaker, Dr. Marta Pariza. And Marta is a computational biochemist. She has been developing and applying data analytical theoretical method and mathematical model and computer simulation to address critical biological problems. She got her PhD in chemistry at University of Porto, Portugal and did the postdoc at EPFL and the UNIM. Now she's working on cancer-related research and the development and the maintain of the Swiss drug design one but web tools with Wescent and uh, Olive. Today, she's go, going to show us how she addressed cancer immune syrup by the structure by informatics approaches. The stage is yours, so please, Mahda. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. So I start by sharing my screen. So hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to give a short talk for the CBDAIS 2020. I'd like to thank you all for 
coming and listening to my virtual presentation. Uh, the title of my presentation is Addressing Challenges in Cancer Immunotherapy with Structural Bioinformatics Approaches. And I will give you an overview of some research uh, I did in Zoet's lab on HLA-1 peptides. So HLA-1 stands for human leukocyte antigen class 1, and recent advances in cancer immunotherapy have led to a renewed interest on these peptides due to their potential use as peptide vaccines. So looking to the figure on the left, uh, there is a simple illustration of HLA-1 peptide presentation. Basically, proteins inside the cell uh, are going to be fragmented into smaller proteins by the cell machinery, namely by the proteasome, and then is HLA that is responsible to present these peptides. On healthy cells, the peptides that are uh, displayed don't bind to the T-cell receptors and the cell is not killed. However, the sick cells display peptides from aberrant proteins associated with, this, with the disease that are going to be recognized by the T-cell and the cell is going to be killed. So databases of HLA-1 peptides hold therefore information on therapeutic targets essential to understand immunity. And in this work, we use extensive and accurate HLA-1 peptidomic datasets, and we map the three-dimensional structure of HLA-1 binding peptides into the source protein for analyzing their pro uh, properties. And we capitalize on the increasing number of uh, structurally determined proteins, namely on protein data bank. And we search for potential differences between the properties in HLA-1 peptides and in peptides from human proteome that are not HLA-1 binders allowing us to understand if there is a bias between HLA-1 peptide and the human proteome. So starting from the first point, uh, we use a huge database of HLA-1 peptides with more than 150,000 peptides and determined by uh, uh, mass spectrometry in Bassani's group. And then for each one of the peptides, we map the peptide on the three-dimensional structures. For example, for this peptide, we have uh, uh, nine uh, proteins that nine PDB codes that display this peptide, and the source protein is uh, an aphase promoting complex. And here are the three dimensional representations of the, the peptide in uh, purple and green. So, purple shows the percentage of the peptide in um, helix, and green shows the percentage of the peptide in um, coil. And in the end, we average over all the matches for the peptide in order to determine the amount of uh, the peptide in helix and the amount of in coil. And we got 76.5% for helix and 23.5% for coil. So we average over all the matches uh, to avoid underrepresentation or um, of certain peptides with respect to the others. Or some peptides um, have representation in more or less proteins, depending on the peptide in question. So um, we analyzed secondary structure uh, for PDB itself, so the first set here in the, in the graph, and we analyzed also the secondary structure for HLA-1 peptide database and subsets of HLA-1 peptide database but divided per length. The frequency of residues um, in helix is in red, and we can see that HLA-1 uh, peptides uh, are enriched in helical content when compared to the protein data bank structures. And this enrichment is more pronounced for HLA uh, peptides with smaller length, namely with eight or nine mer. So going to our second point, when we compare PDB with HLA-1 peptides, we are not comparing the same set size and the same amino acid composition. So to circumvent this problem, we search for bias between HLA-1 peptides and HLA-1 motif-like peptides. And HLA-1 peptides datasets can be divided per allele and present different um, amino acid composition, as we can see here for three alleles uh, on the left of the slide. So for each allele under study, we made use of an in-house developed search that searches across all the human proteome, a set of peptides that match exactly the same number of elements and the same amino acid composition uh, of the reference set, allowing us for an accurate uh, comparison. And if we do so, we have here an example for five alleles, and we converge to motif-like uh, peptides that have 
similar logos to the original peptides. And once again, we see that in HLA1 peptides, we have an enrichment in the helical residues. So to conclude, HLA1 exhibit localization bias to helical fragments in the source proteins. This knowledge refines the understanding of the rules governing antigen presentation. So we saw, we saw in the beginning that proteasome uh, has a paper uh, in the cell cleaving the peptides and the proteasome cleaves preferentially in coil. So we assume that uh, proteasome leaves more uh, helical residues to be displayed by the HLA. And this knowledge could be also added to the parameters of the current peptide MHC class 1 binding predictors to increase their pre uh, antigen predictive ability. So I'd like to thank uh, the molecular modeling groups our collaborators and Vincent for all the support. And thank you all for your attention. Thanks a lot, Mahdi. So next we have the Evelyn Aslashani from University of Basel. Hello. Okay. <clears throat> so thank you very much for the kind introduction. I welcome everyone to this short talk on the SwissMod repository, an up-to-date interactive protein structure database. If one compares the number of entries in Uniprot and in curated SwissProt database to the number of experimentally resolved proteins in the PDB, one can see a discrepancy which is known as the structural gap. Filling this gap with predictions of protein structures is a main goal in the computational structural biology field. An overlooked implication of this is that there are potentially hundreds of millions of protein structures, be it experimentally resolved or uh, generated by modeling. How do we deal with this amount of structural data? Or to be more precise, how do we make this data accessible and useful for life scientists in all biological fields? Answering this question is the main motivation for the Swiss model repository. In the repository, currently, there are 150,000 experimental structures from the PDB and 1.6 million homology models which were mapped to the Uniprot KB. Every week, together with the PDB release, the entries in the repository get updated. The repository sets a focus on 13 model organisms which range from human to E. coli. Here we see a residue coverage plot, which indicates the type of uh, structure covering a specific residue on the 13 model proteomes. This is the fraction which is covered by experimental structures from the PDB. This is the fraction which is extended by homology modeling with various degrees of quality as indicated by this color. And this is the rest of the gap which still needs to be filled by structure prediction. Finally, the repository is cross-referencing seven different databases which range from protein annotations, protein interaction databases, and uh, organism-specific databases. But this is not the only thing the repository has to offer. There are also functionalities for further analysis and visualization of proteins. Annotations from Uniprot KB and Interpro can be mapped to every structure in the repository. The annotations range from functional sites like active sites or various binding sites, structural annotations like transmembrane regions and domain annotations. Here we see metal binding annotation mapped to a protein structure and we can see very well how they surround the two sync ions as you can see here in this structure. Furthermore, it is possible to analyze and visualize the interactions between ligands and proteins. By using the protein ligand interaction profiler, or short CLIP, one can obtain a list of residues which interact with any ligand in your structure. And you can also see what kind, what type of interactions these are. In this example here, we see four hydrogens bonds which interact between the RNA polymerase of SARS-CoV-2 with the potential antiviral candidate drug, Bemdesivir. The homology models in the repository come together with a stringent analysis of the global and local quality. There are four global quality measures, 
which get generally look at the physiochemical plausibility of the homology model. But we also have a look at the local quality of your homology model, as we can see here in this example of the heteromere of homology model between the procreate and exoglyph nuclease and the non-structured protein, where blue indicates a high quality, but there are specific regions which lower quality, like this loop here, which can be identified and visualized in this way. This is actually it. I thank you all for listening. If you want to know more, interact with me later. The poster session in this afternoon, I will be there presenting poster 256, or I will await your questions in the meet the speaker session. If you want to have a look at the Swiss model repository itself, you can see here below the link to it and the QR code. That's it from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abling. And uh, let's thanks again for all speakers for this section. Uh, now we can move on with the next section, meet the speakers. So you could uh, check, uh, you could go back to the program uh, page and click the video symbol on the right or the plus symbol on your left. And you will see one sentence uh, card uh, in the end card, use the link. So both way should be work. See you there. Thank you, everyone. See you in the Meet the Speakers room in a few seconds.